but we're very, very proud today to have the senator here uh, in our county. It's quite an honor. Anytime he can come. Uh, uh, senator Paul took off the same time I did, actually. Uh, he's been our senator for uh, seven and a half years, uh, and he's really done a great job for us. He never forget. I've known him since 1998, and uh, I've known him to be a stand-up gentleman. He's really been uh, a good a man, a political activist before he got into politics himself. Uh, he was with the Taxpayers uh, Alliance. That may be why he's so uh, set on not raising any taxes. But uh, anyway, and he's a person that Kentucky can always count on. And also, uh, Ohio County can always count on. Uh, just recently even, uh, we called him on an issue regarding the flooding we had here and all the damage we had to our roads and infrastructure. Well, uh, what we did, uh, we got a hold of him, and he got us front in line with FEMA. So FEMA's <laughs> already been done here, been here, done our assessment, and we came out well, and we're going to do good. And uh, like I said, Senator Paul always looks out for us. Without further ado, here's our U.S. Senator, Senator Rand Paul. Well, thank you. Thanks for everybody for coming. And uh, we'll try to keep this more of a conversation than a long speech. I know you can hear enough speeches from politicians. <laughs> but I will give you a sort of a little summary of what's going on uh, and what has been going on over the last year or so. I think one of the good things that's happened in the last year or so is that uh, I think your government has gotten away from some of the overzealous uh, regulation where we get too involved with all kinds of business, whether it's uh, farming business or manufacturing business. I think the government just got too involved with telling business what to do, and as a consequence, it becomes more expensive to do business here, and then we lose to competition overseas. So I think on the regulatory front, we've made some real advantages. We repealed about 15 regulations. And there are many people running the agencies of government now who actually are, um, I guess, from business, understand business. Like the, uh, the guy that was appointed to be the secretary, undersecretary of the Army in charge of the Corps of Engineers, which I sometimes have some arguments with the Corps, uh, is a farmer who was born in Hickman uh, County, Kentucky, has been a farmer for many years, and a business person in Missouri, a successful business person. I think that's a, a, the kind of person you want leading some of these agencies who don't think that uh, regulation is always good, that we have to have some, but we don't want to have too much, and that you also have to be able to make a profit and run a business. And so I think that's helped uh, some in the administration. We've got some people who have a knowledge of business and are from the business community. The biggest thing I think that happened last year, and it may be the biggest thing of the decade, uh, was the tax cut. And the reason I'm for the tax cut is that it's returning money to the people who earned it. You know, the money's rightfully yours. You give up some of your money to live in a society where you have police protection and teachers and education, but you don't want 100% of your check gone. You really don't want 50% of your check gone. You want the least amount taken from you that is necessary to run government. So we all want, you've got local government officials here, you've got federal government officials here. We want a certain amount of government. We just don't want too much. How much is too much? That's what we always jockey about in political elections. How much is too much? How much is too little? But the bottom line is we don't want 100% of our check gone, and so you're going to get a little bit more of what you earned back in your check. How much is it? A pretty significant amount, about a trillion dollars in corporate tax cut. Some will say, well, corporations are just rich people. But really they aren't because most of us work for somebody richer than us and even here in a small, fairly rural community, if you work at some corporation here in town, somebody may not own it in Ohio County, but it's still good for you. You've got a good paying job with good insurance and so it isn't you versus a corporation, it's really all of us trying to, to thrive and, and get better. So a corporate tax cut is going to leave over a trillion dollars in the economy. That will buy more goods. It will stimulate the economy. And it's different than the government coming in. So I could come to Ohio County and say, I've got a check for a million dollars, but I don't know who to give it to because uh, it's not really my job to know who's good in business, and I might make the wrong decision, or I might give it because of political favoritism to one person or another. It's better to give it back to you in Ohio County based on what you paid. So if you paid a million dollars in taxes and I paid a hundred dollars in taxes, the guy who paid a million dollars or a woman who paid a million dollars is going to get a bigger tax cut. 
That's just the way it is. You paid more, you're going to get a bigger tax cut. Even if the percentage is the same, 10% of a million is bigger than 10% of $100. But a trillion dollars is coming back to not only your community, to all communities across the country in corporate tax cuts. In addition, there's going to be two trillion more in what's called repatriation. American companies that have made profits overseas, they've been staying overseas. So like Apple alone has $350 billion they're bringing home. They've already announced they're going to have a, a new uh, plant that they build somewhere. They haven't announced where. I saw the CEO the other day in the office. I said, what about Kentucky? And uh, he wouldn't let on where it's going to be. He doesn't want a big competition. But I haven't heard rumors of it being here. But it's going to be somewhere in the U.S. And 20,000 jobs will be created with Apple bringing it home. In addition, they're going to pay $38 billion in taxes. So it's going to bring home money, about $2 trillion that will circulate in the economy, but it's also going to bring back revenue of hundreds of millions of dollars that will go back into uh, paying for some of our costs of government. Altogether, it's about $3 trillion. So in the next six months to a year, year and a half, $3 trillion is going to return to the private marketplace. That has to stimulate you know, the demand to buy things and the energy of the economy. I really think we're going to grow at over 4%. You know, we've been growing at less than 2%, so we've had what people are calling anemic growth. I think we're really going to go up to 4% growth with the tax cut. And I'll end with this. While tax cuts are good, you shouldn't cut taxes and raise spending at the same time. And unfortunately, that's what they're doing in Washington. So I've given them kind of a hard time because when I ran for office, I criticized President Obama at every stop for spending too much and for having big deficits. Now it's my party spending too much and having big deficits, and so I try to be fair that if I was critical of President Obama for it, I've got to be critical of my party now for spending too much and borrowing too much. Under George Bush, the debt went from $5 trillion to $10 trillion. <coughs> Under President Obama, it went from $10 trillion to $20 trillion. We're on our way to, 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 to double it again. Maybe not quite double it, but we're on our way to add another $10 billion in the eight years of the Trump administration. So debt, if you think debt is too much debt is a, is a problem, we, we, so it has to be some kind of critical voice. And it hasn't made me too popular with some of my colleagues in Washington, but I kind of tell people it's inversely proportional. I think, you know, if you're not very popular in Washington, you might still be popular at home for saying the same thing and promising to do the same thing no matter which party is involved. So uh, that's kind of an update of where we are. And uh, really what I'd like to hear is from some of you guys, men and women, how the community's doing, what kind of businesses are doing well, which aren't, and what are your concerns are. Uh, do you want to start us off, Joe? Uh, uh, I want to, uh, again, by, by thanking you for coming. And uh, we appreciate you fighting this, um, your own party, or our own party in Washington to try to get us to do right as well as we did the other guys. Appreciate that. I want to introduce the, everyone to you. Uh, right next to you is uh, Mayor uh, George Chen of Hartford. They give David Randolph. He heads up our career center, which helps uh, manufacturers and employees hook up together. Uh, this is Charlotte Whitaker with AARP in Audubon area. Uh, uh, this Eddie Ambry, he, work, he represents our county on the Workforce Investment Board. Uh, back here, we have Mr. Blaine Piper. He's our uh, CEO of our hospital, which is really good and something we're really proud of. It's growing, and, and uh, we're going to fix it where no one leaves our county line to go for health care. It's going to be here. Uh, Judson Hunter, he's the, he's the uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but then we have Chase Vincent, who is our economic development guy here. He works for our group is called OCEDA. He works for them. Next time we have Les Johnson. He's a retired county court clerk, but he's a, he's a community activist. You don't see anything happen here that he's not there. He's, he's, he's with everybody. Greg Comer is our uh, uh, ag extension agent here in the county. Tracy Bake is our uh, county sheriff. Jason Bullock is a magistrate here, but he's also an uh, educator. So he's here in case there was any questions you had concerning education. He can he can ans answer that. And do you know uh, that's uh, Jason Hasser? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but anyway, that's that's it. And uh, uh, and like I said, uh, I don't question anything because I'm happy with what's going on in Washington. Uh, and I believe basically our 
uh, citizen right here in Ohio County is pretty happy with Washington. Uh, sometimes we've got some problems with Frankfurt, maybe, but not so much with the national. But uh, I just turn it over to you, and you can ask anybody any question you want to or, or take questions from them, however you want to feel. Well, you know, one of the things that's come out recently is, you know, uh, President Trump has put tariffs on China, but now China's saying they're putting tariffs back on us. and. People are worried about a trade war. Does anybody have any uh, comments out from agricultural community or otherwise that wants to uh, talk about uh, how tariffs would affect uh, Ohio County? From an agriculture standpoint, we're always concerned about getting in any kind of a trade war. Of course, our, our corn soybean prices, which are probably two of our, our biggest commodities that we produce here in Ohio County, uh, they have really opened up a lot of export markets. I don't know if you're well aware of it or not, but ag exports are what really keep trade balance in the United States anywhere close to being balanced out here. And anytime you get into a trade war, it affects agriculture immediately. I noticed that there were several products, that, agricultural products that China was talking about uh, putting a tariff on out there. They weren't corn and soybeans yet, but it's just a matter of time before they get there. So. From the agricultural standpoint, we're always concerned anytime you start 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 any kind of a tariff war out there because agriculture gets impacted. And our problem is the prices are not at a profitable level very good right now anyway to begin with. And if you start driving our prices down, now you're putting farmers at an economic disadvantage. You're losing money specifically. <laughs> The hard part about tariffs is when you hear about it, you have sympathy, obviously, for people in the steel industry. We have some people who make steel over in, uh, you know, in the Ashland area. We have some people involved with aluminum up in the Hawesville area. And so you think, well, gosh, we'll save 300 jobs at the aluminum plant. But you have to add it all together, you know, what we do. In agriculture, we say we export about 25% of, of what we grow. If, you know, as much as we complain about not doing well against the rest of the world in a lot of areas of manufacturing, in agriculture, we're probably one of the leaders of the, of the world, you know, as far as, you know, being able to grow crops without pests and, you know, being able to avoid things and have great crops. We do a great job in our country with it. So we don't want to really, you know, cut off our nose in spite of our face. We don't want to actually uh, say, oh, we're going to do this to save 300 jobs and then we lose 30,000 jobs. Uh, if you look at the industries in our state that are actually export, farm is a big export. But we also have a decent automobile industry. We've got Ford, we've got Toyota, we've got, you know, we've got some decent, and then we have all the ancillary uh, smaller businesses that feed into parts, you know, into the automobile industry. They're absolutely against any new tariffs because they're fearing that there'll be reciprocal tariffs or a trade war. Uh, the farmers and the Farm Bureau in general against tariffs because they're afraid of a trade war. I think they put tariffs on fruit, and I can't remember what else. But the other number one they always talk about that would affect Kentucky most particularly is they talk about bourbon because a lot of our bourbon is exported and it's a, a specific Kentucky industry. And so we worry that it's on everybody's list of things that they want to put a tariff on. And um, so I do worry about a, about a trade war and what will happen with it. but. Um, you know, I always say that one way we can try to help aluminum and steel, those who make it in our state or in our country, is could we lessen their regulatory burden or lessen their tax burden um, as a way to try to help them, you know, particularly if they're struggling to try to keep them in business. So um, with the steel industry, when I brought that up, they said, well, getting rid of the income tax won't help because we don't have any income. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a problem if we have no income. How about anybody else else comment on, uh, you know, how much uh, workforce we have and whether or not we have enough uh, workers, basically. I've been to a lot of places in Kentucky where people uh, in charge of the plants in the area are saying we're having struggle to get enough workers who are either drug-free and have work ethic. And we have about 4% unemployment statewide. Do we, are we doing well with workers? Any suggestions for yes. workforce? I have a question as far as the county. I would represent the county in economic development. Chase, <coughs> ours is we built a new water plant. We have a new sewer plant. We have the land. We have the location. We're working on our skill trades right now. But the welfare reform would be because we can't find the people to work. Our jobs, we've lost two plants. Our expansions because nobody wants to work or it's cheaper to stay home than it is to work. And if there was a way the federal government could work on welfare reform, but you know where you have to work so many hours and then they would subsidize you on top of that. And those people working then, then would be paying taxes 
and we would be we could be filling our jobs. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, the way I look at work is I think everybody should work. Everybody who can work should work, and that work is not a punishment. Work is actually the reward. And so many of our problems that we have as a society are related to non-work. And so when we say we have 4% employment in Kentucky, that doesn't tell the whole story. We, in many communities, have 20, 25%, even 30% non-workers. They're no longer counted because once you're not on unemployment insurance, which means you've been out of work for more than 26 weeks, you're no longer counted. Now, the governor has, has asked for a work requirement for Medicaid, which I think is a good idea, and it's for only for able-bodied people. So it's not for pregnant mothers, it's not for people who have an injury that they can't work, it's for working people that are able-bodied. I think that's a great idea, and I think it makes you a better person. And also, when you get used to it, you get a skill also that may help you to go get a, a real job. That's part of the answer to it. Um, you know, some of the training and things like that that we do is, is part of the answer as well. But really, you got to get the 20 to 30 percent of people who just are not working back in the workforce. Um, ultimately, if you talk about welfare reform, the simple way to put it is the government wage for not working cannot exceed the market wage for working. You know, so yes. if, it's, if, if you get more for not working, people won't work. But I'll give you an idea of how wages are being bid up. In Northern Kentucky, DHL, which is an international shipper, they're like UPS, but they do mostly international shipping. They're hiring people for the night shift at $22 an hour with a high school degree. $22 an hour. Uh, you have to work at night, so it's not easy, but I mean, for somebody just out of high school, 22 bucks an hour is not a bad job. Really. Um, and most of these jobs, if you stick on a job like that for a couple of years, you might get a day shift, you might become the manager, you know, of your crew or whatever. So um, how we fix it, though, is difficult. I know when, when the governor mentioned a work requirement for Medicaid, there was a guy that was quoted in the newspaper from a small town in eastern Kentucky, and he said, he was 55 years old, and he said, work? Hell, I haven't worked in 30 years. What are you talking about work? But that's a problem. So, do you have any comments about workforce? Or? Well, I'm the director of the Career Center here, and I, I guess I, uh, we were thinking the same, had the same question, but uh, what would you attribute, you know, the, I think it's a little too many free programs. I think that's been the downfall in America, and uh, I come from a background, but I had a strong voice at home that taught me that you work hard to succeed. Uh, I, I am all nothing against anyone being on a free program, but within that age frame, but I feel that that there the time frame for them to be on that program should be narrowed even more than it is because within the Career Center, uh, the numbers still aren't where they need to be where we have people. We have good jobs here in Ohio County and uh, uh, several clients are wanting to expand. I've met with Judge Johnston on that. We have an active GED program. Can <coughs> you elaborate uh, on what you think needs to be cut or what more needs to be done? to get people actively working in the community. I think the hard part is what happens is, let's say that I propose that, we have a bill we're working on, the first response from people on the other side will be that I don't care about poor people or don't care about anybody because of it. It's really the opposite. Yes. I see how it destroys poor people to be on, sure. many, on assistance forever. So I think you're right, making it shorter, so making it temporary, and you could actually step it down too. You could go from you get X to X minus ten dollars, X minus. You know, each month it gets a little less after a certain period of time. So you wean people off of it, and that way, as they're getting started in their job, they might still have a little bit of help. But it has to end. It has to end at some point. It's kind of like unemployment insurance. Let's say we measure sympathy and compassion, and you measure how big my heart is by how much money I will give to people unemployed. What happened during the recession is we went from twenty-six <coughs> weeks which is paid for through our taxes, we have an unemployment insurance program, we went to 99 weeks, so almost two years. What we found is, is that if I came to Ohio County, or if I came to work, and there was an Ohio <coughs> County employer, and there were two people to choose from, I've been out of work six weeks, he's been out of work 99 <coughs> weeks, guess who they always hired? 
every time it's a six week because you're thinking, why has that guy or that woman been out of work? Nine? You're thinking something's wrong with them if they haven't worked in nine weeks or that they're taking advantage of the system when there are jobs out there. So really, being for 99 weeks actually hurts the people you know, that are out that long because they're out from work, they're away from the workplace too long. So it sounds compassionate, well, I'm going to help those people out of work, but in reality, it actually does a disservice because nobody wants to hire anybody that's been out of work that long. And so the other thing we find is that if it's 26 weeks, almost everybody that doesn't have a job by 26 weeks has one by 28 weeks. <laughs> if it's 99 weeks, they've got a job by 101 weeks. So what you've done is push out, and it isn't easy. You know, I, I, I know people who've lost their job. It's not easy when you lose your job. And sometimes in a recession, you take a job didn't pay as much as your last mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. right. Um, but right now, we're in the opposite. We are in a good time. I mean, we're at a time when wages are being bid up, and when people are saying, I can't get enough workers, the only way they're going to get more workers is wages will have to rise, and then we also have to do something about the government mm -hmm. wage. We can't have the government wage be competing with the private market. But I think wages are going up, and I think it's a good thing to have, and we just have to figure out how to... Uh, motivate the citizenry to get enough workers. But it's a good thing for people to work. If you think about it, your job or your product or your service is a big part of who we are. Right. Uh, our product, service, or job is at least a third of our being, a third of our being a human being. Right. So I think it's important for people to work. Yeah, and some people put it this way. They say your self-esteem, nobody can give you self-esteem, right. but your self-esteem comes from work. And some people think, oh, you get more self-esteem if you're a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist. No, you get self-esteem <coughs> from any work, no matter what it is. If you do a hard job and at the end of the day you feel like you accomplish something. Now, it's not saying every job is as desirable as the next job, but self-esteem comes from good hard work and earning your way in life. Um, and we rob that from people when we permanently have them all. And I think a lot of, we, there is a relationship between non-work and drug use. Yes. People who are working are for the most are on drugs le have less of a drug problem than those who are not working. I'd like to address a couple of things, but Mike, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here and showing your concern for our community. Uh, I too serve on the work workforce initiative board along with, uh, in conjunction with uh, David and Chase, and we try to provide jobs as much as we can to the community through the grad uh, office, and then also prepare these students coming out of school so they be. Uh, groom for these jobs and it's it's a tough situation because a lot of times those don't match up so you've got to get to the bottom of what the problem is and try to solve it and, and work toward employing these folks whenever it's because a lot of them are not going to college some of them go to trade school instead and some go right into the, the workforce so we kind of have to meet all three of those criteria and the other thing i'd like to address is on the pension side of it as you know you know i've met with you in your office several times in dc and over even more than you when you were busy but uh, I, uh, too, I'm a member of the United Mine Workers, and we're still in a struggle to try to, you know, get our pensions. We met with you previously when we were working on our health care and our pensions, and we achieved our health care, but the pensions were not uh, put in the bill along with that, so we're still trying to, to get that, and as you know, the last spending bill didn't include anything for those pensions, and so now they have set up a committee, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, four Republican, four uh, Democrat senator, four Republican, and four Democrat congressmen that are going to serve on a committee and have to come up with something by the end of November to provide for Congress and Senate to vote on. And uh, what I'd like to, uh, to say to you is we would really appreciate if you could help us uh, with some of your members, uh, like Lamar Alexander, and some of the folks that are not from the coal areas, because as you know, this is a coal mining community back in the 70s and 80s, we had thousands of people working here in the uh, UWA mines. And because of that, and as a result of that, we have a lot of retirees living here now, which helps sustain our local economy. We pay out, uh, there's t nearly 10,000 in the state retired UMWA miners, and we pay out 600 million annually to those retirees all over the country, but to the tune of over 50 million just in Kentucky. And us being a uh, previous coal mining area and there's still some mines but not necessarily union mines but the miners that are the age now to have worked back then are retired and are not able to go to Louisville and Lexington and right. Paducah to spend their money they spend it here at home and it would be very very hard on our local economy if you know we lose those pensions right. because it's a 
The, and, and the other part of it is just the moral issue of these people work a lot of times 40, 45 years in the mines right. and earn these pensions and through no fault of their own but because of the bankruptcy laws in the next uh, couple of years combined with the last four we will have lost $31 billion in funding to our plan through bankruptcy. Right. And I think that's a good question and it, in, in some ways it's a complicated question because we have a pension problem at the state also Absolutely. with state workers that, that are short of money. So basically, the mine workers' pension, short of money. The state government, short of money. So chronic sort of problems with this. And you mentioned one thing that really doesn't seem fair, that companies were protected by the bankruptcy laws, but the workers kind of got the shaft in the pension. And uh, I agree with you, that doesn't seem fair. I think moving forward, and this doesn't necessarily help those on the pension, but I really think pensions uh, are something that, while people like them who are getting them, I just don't know if they're honest accounting that we can do it. So for example, uh, in Detroit, all the policemen and the firemen had a great pension, so did the teachers. Well, Detroit used to have 3 million people, now it's got 700,000 people, and the police force is one third of what it used to be, and they, there, there isn't enough coming in mm -hmm. to pay for the pension. To me, the only honest pension is one that actually has the money in it and isn't dependent on the next uh, generation of workers. So for example, let's say General Motors has 10,000 workers, and the only way their pension works is if they always have 10,000 workers every generation. It requires the next generation to fund the pension. That's not a very good pension because if, if General Motors goes on tough times and has 5,000 workers, they got half as much coming in, their pension mm -hmm. fails. And so we have to figure out a way that things are fully funded all the time. So even if everybody went bankrupt, the pension has its money. And uh, some of that's looking back to things we did, we probably did wrong, including some of our bankruptcy law, should we let people escape from uh, their employees. Right. Through, through the other bankruptcy. part of that equation is the 08 market crash cost us a third of our assets overnight. We were 93% funded at that point in time. Right. And we were paying out the most we ever paid in pensions. And then with all the bankruptcies, right. it was just a a dial, you know, a spiral. Uh, that and we then we also, control. the other thing I always tell people, we have to figure it out within the context of we're now running a trillion dollar deficit, right. so where's the money come from? I'm not saying you can't find the money, but my point of view is if you find the money, you should take it from something else that's less important. Right. And what we typically do is we just borrow more money. <laughs> we, don't, we don't take it from anything. <clears throat> so I've been an advocate. We're spending $50 billion a year on the war in Afghanistan. We've been there 16 years. And as much as I was going after going after the people that attacked us on 9-11, I was for killing bin Laden, I was for all of that, it's now been 16 years. We're mostly building their roads, building their bridges, then somebody bombs them, then we rebuild them again. That I think some of that money needs to stay spent here at home. So we have problems not only with pensions, right. we got problems with roads, bridges, and things that we need to build in our country, infrastructure in our country. The president's talked about infrastructure, but we, have, we really don't have any money for it. And so we have to figure out what are our priorities. And um, I read the other day that we have troops in 54 of 55 African countries. When, when four soldiers died in Niger, the uh, country in, in Africa, most people didn't know they were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we had a soldier die in Yemen. Most people didn't know that we were at a war in Yemen. And, and did we vote for it? No, they're all basing it on that 9-11 vote from 16 years ago, which I would have voted for, and yet I don't think that applies to what we're doing. We now are going to have people fighting in the war who were born after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I think they deserve to force the people up there to vote again on where and when we should be at war. So I've been advocating for that, not only for economic reasons, but because I have three nephews who serve in the military. Uh, that I think it's it's really our responsibility to those who serve in the military to make sure we've had an adequate debate among all of us about when and where we should be at war. But it kind of ties into whether, where we have enough resources. The, the other thing about that, and I just want that to be information for these folks too, because a lot of them don't realize what's going on. I know right. that we've talked with you about it, but this last uh, bill that we were going to try to get through, we were actually asking for government loans that we would pay back. We weren't trying to secure money from the government and not, you know, pay it back. So that was our answer to fixing right. this problem. So it's not like we have to have our right. funded, and we have a closed system. So in the, la uh, the last five years, we fought for our pension health care. We've lost 25,000 members. So we're going to end our own problem, right. you know, right. in, the, in the near future, unfortunately, through attrition. But I just right. wanted to let people know that.
Anybody else? Uh, it's my turn. Uh, always an honor to have you an Ohio County Senator and on behalf of the 470,000 AARP members across the Commonwealth, we say thank you for your service to us. Uh, we uh, appreciate the grandparent bill that's just recently passed. Uh, approximately 55% of our grandparents here in Ohio County are rearing grandchildren because of our drug problem. Now, Sheriff Tracy is keeping our jail full but it's still, thank goodness, the, these children have grandparents to take them and care for them and provide for them. Uh, we are concerned about in-home services. I think you shared with me one time in Washington that your grand, was your mother on meal, the meal program for She was part of the meals and uh, she was part of giving out meals and meals. Oh, uh, so, the, so you're... She did for like 20 years, yeah. Very involved. You know what that's about. Brenda Renfro is our director here and, and we have waiting lists for meals ever county in the commonwealth have people waiting and unfortunately they die waiting for these meals or in-home services so please continue to remember in-home services you know how important those are to the seniors uh, here in not only Ohio County but Kentucky um, what is your opinion of the future of Social Security where is it going to go I know you've shared I thought I said only easy questions <laughs> We started out with just one one industry's pension. Now you got the country's pension system. It's completely broken. But you're the man. You're yeah. out there. No, it's it's a big problem. So here we're talking about you know maybe tens of millions or hundreds of millions. With Social Security, we're seven trillion dollars short. Now it's a, there's some debate on that. Some will still argue. You know, if Harry Reid were here, he'd say no. We have two trillion dollars in surplus in Social Security. But it's complicated. If you were to go to the Social Security office, what you'd find is a stack of paper, treasury bills worth $2 trillion. That was paid. You paid in in taxes. All of us did. We paid in in taxes. And we were paying in more than they were paying out in Social Security. So what did Social Security do with the money? They bought treasury bills. And they have them, but they're non-negotiable. So they can't go to the stock market and sell them. They can't go to the public and sell them. They're only redeemable by the treasury. Well, the treasury has to buy them with your taxes. And we, are, we are short basically and we have to buy those treasuries so really Social Security right now pays out more than comes in there's more retirees than there are than what's coming in from workers and it's about a seven trillion dollar shortfall over a couple of the decades <coughs> period uh, you know you either can raise everybody's Social Security tax or you can have everybody wait a little bit longer to get their Social Security or you can means test Social Security I would do both of those. I would for the next generation. I'm 55. For my age and younger, I'd say, guess what? It's going up a couple months every year. And by the time you get to be it, by the time I get there, it'll probably be 70. That saves a lot of money. People say, well, I don't want to wait that long. But I don't know how else to do it. Because it's either that or we, at the end, what happens in about 10 or 15 years, we get to a cliff and everybody has to have a Social Security cut 25%. The problem with that is there are people who live on six seven hundred dollars a month they can't take a 25 percent cut um people who've been successful many of us in this room could be means tested and make a little bit take a little bit less if you give me three hundred dollars less than social security when i retire i can survive on three hundred dollars less because i will have other means hopefully of, of my retirement so that's what i would do is to those who are pretty well off and have done pretty well i take a couple hundred dollars a month from them that's called means testing based on income um but at the very bottom you wouldn't take any so I would take it from those who made more money, they'd give a little bit less in Social Security, and we, everybody would wait a little bit longer. Um, one of the complaints from the other side is that many working class people have to work harder and retire at a younger age because they've worked construction, they're gonna retire at 60 because their bodies beat up from doing all the work. And so it is harder, and you have to figure out something to do with early retirement for those who can't work. You know, but uh, something has to be done. What we've been doing is sticking our head in the sand and doing nothing, which is kind of like the state government. Right. And I know some people are unhappy with the governor, but the governor has been brave enough to tackle a problem that, if we do nothing, gets worse over time. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the teachers are upset with him, but he's trying to save the pension for the teachers, <laughs> for the law enforcement, for those. And it's not like he's trying to punish those people. He's trying to figure out, this is my opinion, he's trying to figure out how to save it for them, but there is no way of saving a pension that doesn't involve some punishment by those who are still giving to it. Being punishment being you probably gotta give more to, to make the pension sound. But also, I also wonder whether or not some of that pension money in the state pension got spent on other things in the general budget over time and whether that was fair or not fair. That's why if you have a, a retirement fund 
Uh, well, it may not sound as good at, at first, but a 401k is in your name, in your account, and the state can't touch it. So I think the idea, and I think it's what we're going more to, is the state may still help fund your 401k, but uh, it's yours, and it's in your name. And if that had happened in mine works over time, we wouldn't have this problem. You'd have had it now. Well, yeah, I'd have it now. Yeah, and, uh, and some of it's actually pretty good. I've talked to some of the mine workers now, the current ones, who are having matching 8% in their 401k from what they put in, which is pretty darn good. Um, but it's a big problem. Uh, and right now, nobody's talking about it at all. Nobody's willing to... Uh, and I'll, I've sat down next to Democratic congressmen and senators who are willing to talk about it, but nobody in leadership is because it involves something that isn't, you know, it's not like how everybody's jumping up and down and saying, hey, we're going to make you wait longer for your social security. It's not something not that we want to hear. It's not something, you know, that's really desirable to tell people, although it's a truth. We're going to have to do it at some point. Medicare, you have any comments on Medicare? It's the same comment, except it's a bigger problem. Medicare is 35 to $40 trillion short. If you raise the age and means test the benefits, so rich people pay a little bit more and everybody waits a little bit longer to get it, that fixes one-third of the shortfall of Medicare. Part of the problem with Medicare, and this is a universal problem of health care in general, and you will not hear this in any of the debates in Washington or on TV, is the primary problem with health care is you, to have competition, you have to have freely fluctuating prices according to supply and demand. That's a basic economic thing. That's how competition occurs. In medicine, you don't have any of that. So I do cataract surgery, or used to do a lot of it over in Bowling Green. The price I charge is the same as every doctor charges in the whole country because Medicare pays for 95% of cataracts because most people are over 65. So there is no price competition. Nobody charges less, everybody charges the same. Uh, it's the same with almost everything, even private insurance. Uh, Blue Cross pays every doctor in the state of Kentucky the same for cataract surgery. So there really isn't any price competition. But if you want to go buy electronics, you call a couple people and you find out what the price is. Even at the grocery store, there's 10 different varieties of bread and there's 10 different prices. And people look at the price and that forces the more expensive ones to come down. If no one's buying them, they've got to bring the price down. None of that's happening in medicine. And that's what you really need in medicine is you need competition. If you want to get rid of your glasses though and have LASIK surgery, the average patient calls four doctors because you'll shop based on price because you're going to have to pay out of your wallet. Your insurance isn't going to cover it, Medicare is not going to cover it, but if you want to pay for it, you've got, you're going to have to pay out of your pocket. So you will shop based on price, and the price of LASIK has gone down 75% over the last 10, 15 years. Contact lenses, you know, very, very competitive, you know, because people pay out of their pocket mostly for them. So we have to inject capitalism into health care, but we also need to inject it into Medicare as well. Thank you. We do appreciate sure. you. Yes. In my mind, we can't talk about welfare reform without talking about justice reform. Um, as you know, we have the highest you know, amount of incarcerated people in the developed world. Here in Ohio County, like has been said, you know, our jail is full. It relates to our available workforce. It relates to grandparents raising their grandchildren. And the vast majority of these people that are incarcerated are nonviolent drug offenders. <coughs> and the recidivism rate is sky high. So. In my mind, it seems that this, this system obviously isn't working. Right. Do you have any ideas of how we could reform justice, our justice system to, I don't know how you instill personal responsibility in someone, uh, you know, frankly, but right. uh, to somehow get these people trained in skills instead of just sending them back out the door to the right. environment that, that led, you know, that created yeah. them becoming an addict in the first place. Uh, you know, because I see the more opportunity we can provide, the less incentive there is for people to either become addicted to drugs or commit crimes and land themselves in jail. Right. And we're at the, you know, we're at the crossroads now where we're looking at having to build a new $15 million jail to house these uh, the increasing amount of inmates. You know, I am for criminal justice reform. I believe in second chances. Um, you know, for religious re reasons, I believe in redemption, that you can, you can change your ways and change your life. I think the drug courts have helped some with some of what's going on here. There are some people being diverted from prison through, through the drug courts. Um, but it's still a, a huge problem that we have. And I, I think that, you know, as a Republican, Republicans go around saying we're for family values and family this and that, which I am. But in order to, one of the biggest things disrupting families is basically jail. And then if people get out of jail, can't work, <clears throat> they go back to either selling drugs or committing crimes because they can't get a job because they've got a criminal record. 
Um, I've visited some of the different businesses and groups around the state that are hiring people who have criminal records. Um, most of them have been nonviolent, but drug crimes to try to get people back. Uh, Goodwill does this. There's a place in Louisville called Caudill Seed, and the owner is just a great guy. He's just taken it upon himself. He hires people who have been alcoholics, people who have filmed Narcotics Anonymous. And I sat around a table about 15 workers. Some of them have been working for him for now 15 years. And they say, I go to AA, and I'm his sponsor. And it was just amazing that he's taken it upon himself to hire people who have had trouble. And many of them become good workers. Uh, my wife went to Isaiah House, which helps uh, in drug rehab. And she says one of the great things about it that employers ought to look is that they're drug tested there, that if you really want somebody who's going to be drug free to show up every day for work, hire them from one of these rehab places because they're actually getting testing during the rehab. Um, ultimately, we've got to figure out how to not have so many people on drugs, but I do think that those who are on it, and I think also kids make more mistakes. I think there are certain window boys especially make more mistakes than girls. And up to about age 25 is where a lot of crime and drugs and all that stuff's happening. We can get them beyond 25. But I am for, for second chances and figuring out how to separate out. Now, if there's violence involved, they need to be separated from us and from society. But the users and small-time dealers who are also probably users at the same time, if we can figure out a way to get them back into the system, either through drug court or something else, I'm for that. Do you have any comment, Sheriff, on that? Well, Senator, I do. The, one of the things that disturbs me is that we can get funding for uh, a, a wonderful museum that we have here, and I'm not knocking our museum, but we can't get funding for an $18 million jail that we can't afford. Uh, I think here in our county, we can't house state inmates. We have to transport those from other jails, <clears throat> which today I have six deputies transporting because prisoners. Full. Well, because it's a life safe jail and they won't allow us to hold state inmates at our jail. What does we that can, mean? What does a life safe jail mean? It, uh, it's more of the standards that the state puts on us. That yeah. you, if you don't have this at your jail, then you can't hold this type of prisoner. Yeah. So, uh, Do you think we ought to address some of those questions, whether yes. or not we went too far with some of those rules? Yes. And, because then maybe you could use your car. Yeah. We could do that, yeah. I, I think a lot of our problem here in the county, uh, you know, we have a huge arrest rate, and then we're looking to get them out of our jail because it's full, uh, and, and people... Are, are they know here that we're you're not going to be in jail very long no matter what you do we're going to try to get you out because our jail's full you know we've looked at building jails and and and, and whatever we can do to offset that that's one of my, my biggest concerns but one of my the most important thing to me here as sheriff is that we keep our schools and our our educators safe uh, I, I wanted to ask you you know, I feel as a sheriff, I have a responsibility along with the school board, which I work closely with here. We, we have a good working relationship with our school board. Uh, we have two, probably uh, in better shape than most counties, we have two school resource officers, one that stays in our middle school, one that stays in our high school. But we have all of the schools in our counties, the, the middle schools, or the uh, grade schools, that are unprotected as far as someone there constantly. Now I schedule my deputies in and out of those schools. What what are you guys doing to ensure that we have that safety for our, our right. schools? And what what do you what's your feel on that? And you know I'm a big believer in deterrence, and that a person in a uniform carrying a weapon is a deterrence. That's why we ask you guys to come to our when we <laughs> do our town halls and things. Not because we think it was going to be violent, but there is a deterrence. And these crazy uh, young kids uh, have sort of a profile, but they don't, they don't show up at sheriff's office. They show up where there are no guns and no resources. So I think having the resource officers is part of the answer. In this case in Florida, this boy probably committed two dozen felonies and no one ever charged him. So part of it is we have to be a little more aggressive. I don't want to take away Second Amendment rights from like, you know, 10,000 people or 2,000 people in Ohio County in one fell swoop. But if there's one young man at your schools here that's threatened a teacher, let's charge him. Because once you are charged, convict him of a felony, and if I'm on the jury, if you have a young man here in town who says, I'm going to kill the teachers, or I'm going to shoot up the school, we just have to unfortunately take that very seriously. And if I'm on the jury, I'll vote yes to convict him. And I'm sure a bunch of your folks will. You take his guns away. And then it's not just putting them on a list. That boy, if he would have been convicted of a felony, 
you physically go into the house and he cannot own weapons. He probably would not be allowed to live in a foster house with weapons. I mean, you really would try to isolate that kid from, from guns. Maybe either grows out of it or gets institutionalized or something. But uh, the real problem there had nothing to do with Washington. It had to do with the sheriff's office. It went 40 times that kid's house. There was a federal program supplying more money to the schools to lower their arrest rate. So in Broward County, and this is a county that has, you know the sheriff's office has 6,000 employees? Can you imagine having 6,000 employees? I mean, that's, that's bigger than some state law enforcement agency. <coughs> so they were, their arrest rate went down 63% in one year once federal money became available for not putting kids in prison. And really, to tell you the truth, I don't want every kid that's caught smoking pot in prison. I think that's a mistake. But I kind of have a much lower threshold for people that are either committing violence at school or uh, are threatening violence. And really, with these school shooters, it's threats. He was online posing with his weapons, but saying he wanted to be a professional school shooter. I mean, those are tricky situations, but those, those have to be prosecuted, I think, in order. And it was sad that every kid, as they heard the gunshots ring out, was saying, I'll bet you it's that kid. Mm -hmm. they, they immediately were saying, has anybody seen him? It's probably him. And so everybody knew about this kid and nothing. Child welfare had been notified about him. The police had been to his house. I guarantee the school district, when you look through his file, and somebody's probably going to, is going to find that he threatened teachers. Because that everybody, everybody was worried about him. And nobody did anything to arrest him. And so we have to find out those people. And they are actually, as, as, as sensational as they are, as horrible as they are, they're still rare occurrences. You know, uh, but because we see them all the time, then everybody sort of kids shouldn't have to go to school <coughs> here for that. Uh, but I think all of us have to do a better job of isolating out people who are uh, are troubled. And some of these things are so hard to stop. The, the Sandy Hook shooter was a mentally troubled kid whose mom decided to be a great pastime for him to, mm -hmm. to teach him about guns and have him shooting all the time. That's probably not what your mentally unstable child needs to be doing as a pastime. But then when he went to get the guns, he didn't buy them. He, wasn't, he, he was too young to buy them. I mean, he shot his mom and took the guns from the, from the house and then went and did the shooting. So um, not easy. Some people, you know, I like the idea of mentoring and things, but I think also, and I'm for mentoring, don't get me wrong, I don't think this kid was getting better with mentoring. There are just some people who are just, they, he was a sociopath of some sort, and uh, he needed to be stopped, not necessarily made better. So, but, and part of it's the deterrence of you being there, or, um, and not everybody's going to agree on this, but I think teachers who want to do concealed carry, I'd allow them to do it in a certain program. And the main thing is announcing it. It's like, it's like the uh, cockpit. I want every terrorist in the world to know that our pilots are armed now. Mm -hmm. Not because the chances are that great. You really don't want to get in a gunfight in a cockpit, but at the same time, you want every terrorist in the world to know that if you get into the cockpit, guess what? You're going to have a gun there, and you're going to have a fight. Um, but if you announce the opposite, that we're going to have gun-free cockpits or gun-free schools, it's an incentive for these troubled kids to say, this is where I'm going to show up. So um, no easy answers, but I think the only thing about it that aggravated me is everybody was looking to Washington or accusing the NRA of killing these kids. And look, I know a lot of people in the NRA, they are not people who want kids to be shot. I mean, that's just such an unfair thing to say of anybody. And, or anybody that defends the Second Amendment, somehow you want kids. Nobody wanted that to happen. And uh, I think we get rid of the politics and look stepwise through what happened there. There are probably half a dozen things we've done, and most of them are at the local level to try to figure out how to, to stop this. Oh, Senator, we have time for one more question. All right. Anybody that hadn't had a question that uh, wants? I want to be mayor here for five months. So I'm fairly green at all this. Uh, I am thankful for the federal money that does come down because it enables us to do projects. We've got three projects going on right now in Hartford <coughs> with our water system that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do without federal money. And I'm very thankful for that. You mentioned something earlier about regulations, and the more regulations that come down from the federal government um, create more dilemma for us. And one in particular that I've encountered has been the uh, quality of the water. Uh, it was at what was deemed to be a reasonable level and then it's been lowered down to the point now that it puts quite a strain on us at any cost. And, and uh, it's at a level now that they tell me that you would have to drink you know, an unreasonable amount of water over an unreasonable length of time to develop a small percent <laughs> chance of cancer. And so 
sometimes I think we kind of go overboard with that, you right. know, with the regulations. And I don't I can't do anything about that, but you know, I just want to be in somewhere <laughs> about this. And as as a private citizen, I'm gonna say that I don't mind paying taxes at all. I just wish there was a better accounting of my tax money when we got to you, it. You and me both. Okay. Yeah. I'll mention one thing on the water. We all want clean water. Right. We all we, we all realize there's going to be some <coughs> form of regulation. There, there was a Clean Water Act years ago that says you, you can't discharge pollutants into a navigable stream. Probably everybody here agrees with that. You shouldn't be able to go to a sinkhole and dump your benzene down right. your sinkhole into a stream sure. underground that's running and transmitting it to other people into the groundwater. But what happened over time is the federal government decided that dirt was a pollutant and that every ditch on every farm was uh, a navigable river. So we lost common sense. A ditch is not a navigable river that sometimes has water in it. A navigable river is a stream, underground or otherwise, or a lake or something like that. But, uh, and dirt's not a pollutant. You know, but once we allowed that, now we got the EPA coming on people's land saying they can't, you know, make their cattle pond bigger, or they can't excavate around some ditch to improve drainage on the land because they've ruined the wetlands because now they're draining the water off their land. So that's where it got to be kind of crazy. When we get to limits, um, I had this debate one time with, uh, with Barbara Boxer, and so it's something called uh, what's well, Clean Air Act, but it's cross-state pollution. They worry about pollution from one state flowing to another. And I'm not for no rules, but I was for not decreasing level from here to here because I thought it was going to be very expensive and it was at the low level that we already had and we've been living with for quite a while. So I wasn't arguing for no limits, I was just arguing not for going from here to here, This, this the incremental change in the regulation. Well, she put pictures of uh, little kids with asthma and said I was for genocide and I wanted hundreds of thousands of kids, stupid stuff like that. Instead of arguing, can we afford to take that incremental change and is it really going to make us healthier? Because the science on this is not always sort of uh, clear cut, um, you know, and, and there's going to be a certain amount of impurities that we do live with. Sure. So cars put impurities in the air. We try to minimize them when we have some rules. But is there a limit at which, you know, if we if we say every car has to have 60 miles to the gallon, our car is going to cost eighty thousand dollars a piece. You know, everybody got to pay eighty thousand dollars to get a car. So we have to balance these things. And I think the pendulum had gone too far on overregulation, and so I think we have to come back. And um, you know, uh, particularly with water, if there's a specific uh, regulation on some specific impurity in the water that you're talking about, <coughs> if you'll write that for me and get it to Jason, he'll get it to me. Because also, if we had several counties, like uh, when you meet with county judges, executives, or with mayors, if a bunch of people have the same complaint. If you'll kind of organize together with some other mayors and stuff and let us know, you can all sign a letter saying this particular regulation, um, and it, it is the nitty gritty. We may be able to right now send a letter if it's EPA. We may be able just to send a letter to the EPA, and there's a possibility they'll listen, a very small possibility. Look, we know but, we've got these byproducts that are going to match up for Right. But like if the level was at a 1.0, now it's down to a 0.6 or right. something like exactly. that. So almost half of what it was. Right. And just that added little bit, it looks like a small amount. But it's so sensitive that when our people do our testing, they can't, right. they can't bathe, they can't wear any deodorant, they can't wear any right. mouthwash, anything about them right. that will affect the testing of that, that's how sensitive it right. is, you know, it's just... And that's the question of, is there a real scientific difference or a real health reason why one level is, is better than another? And some of the stuff you're talking about is naturally occurring, right? It's sure. just in the water, it's not coming from industry, right. it's, it's not coming from farming. It's just natural product of the process we go through. Exactly. So, um, and then some of it uh, makes us an incredibly safe society. So those who complain about chlorine, ought to realize that countries who have no chlorine in the water have, you know, all kinds of waterborne diseases, including cholera and that. And it's one of the, if you've ever been on a mission trip, one of the remarkable things about our country is clean water, you know, and most of that's from putting chlorine in the water so we can distribute it to lots of people. So, but anyway, we'll definitely look at it. And if anybody has specific things like that, if you'll write them down for us or work with a group of mayors and stuff, it helps us to sort of narrow the focus. And we will try to help. Sure. We'll, we'll see if we can help with the regulatory agency. Um, and also looking at the law over time to see if we can do it. A lot of this doesn't come from law. It actually comes from the regulatory agency right. creating new law. Right. And we can try to influence it. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody.
Thank you so much. Thank you.